Two children, little boys who never had a chance. Nigel Brown, a nine-year-old, killed by a stray bullet while he slept one year ago today. He was my king. He has always been my king. I feel her pain. I understand. I mean, I really, I really want us to solve it. But the killer is still out there. Jason Mathis, a four-year-old who police believe was killed by his own mother. State investigators were onto his mother his entire life. So why couldn't they save him? WLV News 10 investigates digs for that answer. From your hometown news source, this is WLB News 10 at 6. Every year, more than 1,800 teens and children die from gun violence in the United States. Now that's five children a day. One year ago today, Nigel Brown became one of those children while he was asleep in his bed. He was just nine years old. One year later, no one's been charged for Nigel's death leaving his family desperate for answers. WLB News 10's Molly Godley has covered this story from day one. She joins us live in the studio now. Molly, one year later, how is Nigel's family? Jim, Carla, Nigel's mom, Yolanda Brown, says words can't describe what her family is going through. Just days after her son was killed, she said she would forgive the person or persons responsible. Those are words she still stands by today. I do. 100 because I know that bullet wasn't meant for my son. It was a stray bullet, but you fired it. So I forgive you. Once I forgive you, you have to answer to the higher power. So therefore, I forgive you. I did my part. Open it. Days before Nigel Brown's life was tragically taken, he was celebrating his ninth birthday. Can you talk to me a little bit about how you remember Nigel? Oh, my baby, my baby. Um, he was my king. He have always been my king. He was full of joy. He's the only one who really looked just like me, so it was hard. He was right there with me at all times. His death was a wake-up call for many people in Albany, calling for senseless crimes and gunfire to stop. Support groups use peaceful protest and donation drives like car washes and benefit rides to raise awareness. A Crime Stoppers reward that started at $5,000 grew to what it is now, nearly $18,000, but still no answers. I sat down with Albany Police Chief Michael Persley to find out where the investigation stands now. You know, we're in a situation where uh, we've had other people come forward to talk about other homicide cases and, and I'm talking about put us right where we need to be. In this case, hardly anything other than just names. Why do you think this one is so different? Maybe in this one, because it's, you know, such a tragic case that nobody really wants to own up to what happened because of the, the pressure that will come on them. I, I don't know, but we, 100% we do rely upon the community. You were quick to call this a senseless killing. Mm -hmm. Is it frustrating for you a year later? I know you say that you have some names called in, but still there's no one to really charge with the death. What do you think it says about the person who is responsible? Those who were specifically involved, they have not slept peaceful for a year. There's no way that they could have had a good night's sleep knowing that they were responsible for the death of a child who hadn't even started living life yet. One year later, Nigel's mom, Yolanda Brown, is using this tragedy to advocate for victims of gun violence, giving them resources to get the support they need. It's called the Team Nigel Foundation. Because they was taken away from us, they don't mean their name have to die. Can you tell me kind of what the past year has been like? Crazy. Every day is frustrating. Every day I look and hear my phone ring, and I'm just waiting on that one phone call mm -hmm. to come through and say we have someone in custody. Anything you want to say to the person who knows something or even to the person who may be responsible for this? Turn yourself in and say something. Give me justice. Give the city of Albany justice. It's been a year. He's not coming back. You're still here. You can pick up the phone, call mom, daddy, or your loved ones. We're not able to give Nigel a hug or even get a phone call from him. 
So give me justice, give me a peace of mind. Brown tells me the last year has been extremely difficult for her family, but she believes this case will not go cold. She says with help from the community, Nigel's case will get solved soon. To get a look at those full one-on-one -on -one interviews, you can head over to our website, WALB.com. Jim, Carla. And happening right now, there is a candlelight vigil and prayer service for Nigel happening at Floral Memorial Gardens. That is the cemetery where Nigel is buried. Soon there will also be a balloon release in Nigel's honor. Yolanda Brown is also trying to protect other children by fighting against gun violence. WLB News 10's Gabrielle Tate was at today's peaceful protest that was in honor of Nigel Brown. Many people gathered here earlier today to protest against gun violence and advocate for not only Nigel Brown, but other victims of gun violence. Protesters took part in many different chants and held up signs with sayings like honk for Nigel. Brown's mother says she is just as passionate about this case as she was last year. It never stopped hurting, first of all, but I'm in a better spot. After all the events that we have done over this year, over the time period, I would say it just amazing for to see the community still behind me. His name have not died. His name still alive and I'm not the only one who keeping it alive. She tells me they are urging the community to speak up and say something if they know anything. I know that there's somebody out there that knows something and there's a little over $17,000 reward. These people are thinking that the streets are going to be loyal to them. But sooner or later, somebody's going to slip up and say something. Mathis says people with tips don't have to be identified. We need people who will face up to reality, and if they see something, they need to say something. There's several ways you can do it. You can call Crime Stoppers. You won't be asked a name or anything. Brown's cousin, Austin Williams, says ever since the incident, he doesn't feel safe in his community for one simple reason. <laughs> Nigel's mother tells me she will keep the protests going, even if the criminals are caught, because she says this is a bigger issue than just this one isolated incident. Gabrielle Tate, WALB, your hometown news source. And if you'd like to help Nigel Brown's family raise money to find his killers, there will be a yard sale this Saturday. It starts at 8 a.m. and will take place at 1201 West Oglethorpe Boulevard at the Boxed with Love Resource Center. Now, checking out South Georgia's weather, we've seen some clouds and we've seen some rain today over South Georgia. Let's check in with our chief meteorologist, Yolanda Amadeo, to see how long these showers will last. Well, these showers are gradually pushing on off toward the west. I think we'll still have a few areas of rainfall as we move throughout the next few hours. So that will continue into your Monday evening. Right now, showers have become much lighter coming across Seminole and Decatur counties. Also, early Miller counties getting a break from the heaviest of the showers. Notice just along the Flint River, portions of Baker and Mitchell counties. Showers are holding there, but heavy rainfall now continuing to move toward Blakely, moving toward Highway 27 over in early counties. County. What about this cluster of thunderstorms? We've got that moving through Calhoun County, even portions of Terrell County, but now to the west of Dawson. However, Dawson notice this pocket of very heavy rain. Frequent lightning is occurring south of Smithville and just off to the northwest of Leedsburg. That is moving toward the west. Parrot, more rain is heading your way. Also, Dawson, things are about to go downhill. So we do have those areas of thunderstorms, which are few and far between. Notice east of I-75, there are still some showers, and that's going to spread further off toward the west over the next few hours. Now, rain chances will hold as we move into early evening. Things began to settle down during the overnight, but we have have several more days of weather weather before dry air rise along with slightly cooler air and that comes in here by the weekend. Details are in your seven day extended forecast in just a few minutes. Well, the South Georgia father and son found guilty of murdering Ahmaud Arbery were sentenced to a second life sentence earlier today. Gregory McMichael and his son Travis were convicted on federal hate crime charges earlier this year. Their neighbor, William Roddy Bryan, has been sentenced in federal court to 35 years. All three white men were already serving life sentences after being found guilty in state court for chasing down and shooting the 25-year-old black man more than two years ago when he was out for a jog. It was hard to look at them every day as a father. And they show no more for how they took his life. That's the thing that really bothered me real bad. 
and then they act for mercy. They didn't give him no mercy that day. So we don't want no mercy for those Michael. They didn't give us none. They didn't give him none either. No. None at all. Now in court today, Gregory McMichael said he was sorry for Arbery's death. <clears throat> Arbery's mother, Wanda Cooper Jones, said it will not bring her son back, but she accepts his apology. Well, for years, state workers had their eye on a local woman with concerns about her little boy. Neighbors also reported abuse, but no one could save him. And the more calls they get, the more it puts it on their radar that maybe something actually is happening here. Coming up, WLB News 10's investigator Heidi Paxson is going to dig into the four-year trail of evidence before he died. WALV News 10 Investigates is uncovering new information involving a local 27-year-old mother charged with murdering her four-year-old son. In January, we reported the arrest of Kiara Cotton and the discovery of J.C. on Mathis's remains in a Crisp County field. Now, since then, WALV News 10 Investigator Heidi Paxson has been pouring through hundreds of documents in the case. Heidi, those documents show how the Georgia Division of Family and Children's Services struggled to confirm reported abuse in the home. Kira Cotton was charged with murder, concealing a death and cruelty to children during an investigation into the death of her son. But his death and the charges against his mother came years after DFACS began working on that case. The newly released log of contact narratives from the Department of Health Services include dozens of reports by DFACS case managers and police. Those documents, dating back to 2017, give more insight on the conditions of the home and what complaints were reported leading up to the death of J.C. on Mathis. When children are severely abused, these headline cases we see, where children are locked in cages or being trafficked, and the worst of all, the death cases, it is rare, rare that nobody knew that something was going on. 13 days after Jason was born, doctors say he lost nearly two pounds. At six months old, he weighed 10 pounds. In a visit to the home three years later, the caseworker estimated he only weighed 15 to 20 pounds. He was even referred to an intervention program called Babies Can't Wait, which helps children with developmental delays. But it became apparent to investigators there was something else going on in the home. In August of 2020, a caseworker says Jason was fed one meal a day to, quote, avoid him getting a bowel movement. The reporter wrote that he was observed as not verbal, still wearing a diaper, and unbathed at age three. They also observed there were no beds or light bulbs, so the children would not turn on the lights at night. It was also observed that Kira and the father got upset when Jason asked for food or drinks. They reportedly made him sit facing the wall as a form of discipline. There were several reports over the years. Some showed improved conditions in the home. Others showed negligence. The report adds that there are, quote, physical fights all the time in the home. Reports indicate someone observed Jason hiding and crying because he was afraid and could not defend himself. That name was removed from the documents. According to these documents, things got worse in the home after that. The documents show dozens of visits to the home by DFACS caseworkers, but no efforts to take the child from the home nor hold his mother accountable. Tomorrow at 6, the details that ultimately led to the death of four-year-old J.C. on Mathis and why DFACS says it couldn't take J.C. on out of the home before it was too late. Well, the Georgia Secretary of State's office says they are seeing increased numbers of scams targeting senior citizens. Now those officials are urging Georgians to keep watch to protect your senior citizen loved ones. Secretary of State's office has help for Georgia families. They want to make sure that they protect those senior citizen family members. They say family members should inform their senior citizen loved ones about these dangers while looking for unusual activity that could suggest a scam or financial criminal targeting them. It's important to like investigate and to ask questions and stop and ask yourself, what exactly am I being asked to do? When I, what am I being told? And it's your money. So it's important that you protect your money as if it were your child or your grandchild. State's Office of Securities and Charities Division offers help for seniors and their families. If you call 470-312-2640, Secretary's office also partners with AARP, which has a Fraud Watch Help Hotline. That number is 877-908-3360.
Officials say scammers have stolen billions of dollars from unsuspecting senior citizens. Back and forth talks, the city of Albany and Doherty County has reached a compromise on a tax funding split. We'll have more on that after the break. As we continue on into your Tuesday, of course, our dry start to the morning gives way to afternoon showers, even a few thunderstorms with our highs topping low 90s. We'll talk about what's in store the rest of the week coming up next. Now, your WALB First Alert Weather with Chief Meteorologist Yolanda Amadeo. Well, this Monday afternoon became wet, and we've had scattered showers and thunderstorms around. The bulk of the activity is still working its way off toward the west. Getting into our Tuesday afternoon, more showers and storms around, but not nearly as widely scattered in terms of today. But still, some areas will get wet with our temperatures continuing to rise. We'll top it off mostly in the low 90s. Beautiful view along I-75, where most of the interstate has been dry on this Monday. Notice a lot of blue sky, but we've had some building of clouds, not really producing much in terms of rainfall, but we do have some rain cooled numbers right now. 76 here in Albany, 75 in Bainbridge, 83 over in Douglas, 81 in Moultrie, Valdosta right now at 91. You have been mostly dry with a few showers around the city. For the rest of this evening, continuing with evening showers, a few thunderstorms, Holding on to mostly cloudy skies for the rest of tonight. Any showers will be out of here during the wee hours of the morning. Off to a fairly mild start in the morning. Lows in the low 70s. As we continue on into our Monday evening, we have those pockets of showers, even embedded thunderstorms. So these clusters of thunderstorms are producing hefty rainfall. Coming across uh, Terrell County, entering Randolph County, right around Shellman. You are seeing those flashes of lightning. Also with the heavy downpours, there could be some areas of rapidly rising water, so keep a watchful eye to that. Hopefully you can wait until this cluster passes on through. It's moving toward Edison. Also Morgan, heavy rainfall, thunderstorms around the city. Things have gradually tapered off across areas of Baker County. But notice this big area of heavy rainfall off to the northwest of Leesburg. Leesburg, you only picked up some light showers. Heaviest other rain continues to move westward into areas of Terrell County toward Highway 82. So looks like Dawson, you are about to get soaked. Also, eventually into Parrot. Showers extend from Webster County into Sumter County. This area of rain has increased across Sumter County, especially outside of Americas. And then notice along I-75, I told you it was pretty dry. It remains that way, with the exception of a few showers coming across Cook County. And notice those showers extending into portions of Eccles as well as Lowndes County. So at least uh, many areas are getting in on some evening showers. And of course, that has helped to cool things off. Now, according to our forecast model of the rest of this evening, showers along an and east of I-75 will likely increase, but then gradually taper off during the wee hours of the morning. We're off to a dry start on Tuesday. We bring rain chances back not only Tuesday afternoon, but also for your Wednesday afternoon. So it looks like active weather sticks around for the rest of this week. On into the weekend, we have a cold front heading our way, and that's going to bring in drier air, also slightly cooler air, dropping our highs from the low 90s into the upper 80s. Check out your extended forecast. A few showers this evening, but we'll be much drier getting into your Tuesday. Showers and thunderstorms are back for the afternoon with rain chances through Friday, drier and cooler for the upcoming weekend. After a lot of debate, city and, city and county officials in Albany and Doherty County have now reached a compromise on a tax funding split. Two government agencies reached a middle ground in a call meeting today. Commissioners from both the city and the county are ready to move forward mm. on the splashed funding split. They adopted a 64-36 split in the city's favor. The city and the county are working on a plan about how those funds will be allocated. And straight ahead in sports, the Braves struggling. Is it cause for concern? Aaron Mukes has reaction from the clubhouse next. You're watching WALB News 10 Sports with Aaron Mukes. In just 19 days, the college football season officially gets underway. The defending champions from a season ago enter this season looking to be the first repeat champion since the Alabama Crimson Tide did it in 2011 and 2012. On Monday, the preseason USA Today AP coaches poll was released, and this time it's Alabama voted number one again. 54 first place votes, 
The voting is done by a panel of 66 major college football coaches after falling short in the title game last season. Once beating Georgia in the SEC championship, Alabama is back on top and looking for looking to take back the preseason favorite. It doesn't look preseason favorite. It doesn't look like anyone in the Bama program is really concerned with the rankings. Well, you know, for us, you know, I don't we don't really know anything about the polls. You know, that's not something that's talked about in the locker room. That's not something that's put up on the board or like we're here. So like we don't know anything about that stuff. And the motivation locker room is everything that we did last year. All the, you know, bad things that we did last year. That's the only motivation we need that we didn't get our end goal, that we have a participation trophy sitting in the cafeteria that we have to look at every day. It's not an unfamiliar spot for Bama. They hold the number one spot in the preseason poll for the second consecutive year and have been in the top five nine consecutive seasons. The defending champion Bulldogs are ranked third in the poll after losing a number of key starters. That all-time great defense from last season, Kirby Smart is looking to re-up and repeat the success of 2021. Utah, Oklahoma, and Baylor round out the top 10. The full list of the top 25 will be released on August 15th. The Braves are 8-8 eight eight since the All-Star break and struggling to find their footing. This past weekend, Atlanta lost 4-5 to the Mets and are now 6.5 games back in the NL East. They are in the middle of an 11-game road trip, but it's no time to panic. Move on. Off day tomorrow and get back to playing, you know, on Tuesday. Um, you know, obviously it wasn't, wasn't what we wanted, but, you know, it's baseball. At the end of the day, you got to flush it and move on. And, and, and like I said, look forward to getting back on Tuesday and, 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 you know, playing our game. The Braves will head to Boston for two, for two, a four-game set in Miami before returning to Truist Park for another four-game set with the Mets. Now let's look at your fishing game forecast. Your peak times are midnight and 6.20 p.m. All right, thanks, Aaron. National News is next. We'll be back at 11 with more local news that matters to you. Have a good evening, everybody.